Welcome to season three of the Lifestyle Chase, and I'm your host, Chris Little. This podcast features high performers who have found a way to live their best life while balancing their health, wellness, friends, and family. To help this podcast grow, please share it on social media, rate five stars, tell your friends, and check out the past 140 episodes and counting. You can follow me on Instagram at Christian Little and at The Lifestyle Chase. Thanks for listening. Let's get started. All right, so welcome to The Lifestyle Chase, and I am joined by the one and only Tony Gentlecore, and I have to acknowledge the fact that I've kind of like dragged my butt on having you on the show. I'm Shame on you, shame you on. on you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like I, I've had Dr. Lisa Lewis on the show. Oh and, yeah, who's that? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I've had Dean Somerset, he'll be coming back on in a few weeks. And nice. so it was just, it was only a matter of time. Um, so this is episode 190. And first of all, before we dive into anything further, how are you doing today? How's your day going? I'm doing great. I just, I made it back just in the nick of time because I, I went and worked out this morning. So I'm, I'm like 10 minutes post-workout as I, as I log down to, to chat with you. So um, my endorphins are, 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 are kicking right now. So I'm feeling pretty good. That's awesome. I mean, sometimes I just like rip over to the gym to get in a good quick pump, like an upper body session just before an episode, just to kind of like get the confidence going, get the brain juice yeah, yeah. going. Never hurts to get the biceps going a little bit before, yeah. before you're recording, especially for like video podcasts. It just, it makes everybody feel better. <laughs> yeah. And this is actually, um, I joined my first commercial gym in my life. Um, probably about six weeks ago. Uh, and I go maybe once, I definitely go once a week, sometimes twice, uh, just to have a little change of atmosphere. Um, you know, and they have equipment that, you know, they have all the equipment, like my, my tiny studio, like I have all the pertinent stuff that I need, all the important stuff, but I don't have the stuff like a, a seated cable row or all these different machines. So yeah, it was nice to get that upper body workout in right before logging on with you. Well, I mean, the cool thing is that uh, not too long ago, I think it must have been June or something, you actually wrote an article about that and put it on your website. Oh, I did. That's right. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> I forget what I write. I'm, I'm getting, I've, I've written so many things that I, I forget what I wrote last week. Well, I, I just <laughs> so. think it's cool because it's um, when there's someone that's just getting started out in the industry, there's so much to, to look for, like just find a few people that are like setting a good example, go to their website and look at the articles. And, and in, in preparing for this, I went to your website and like, there's more articles than I could possibly handle. Like there's tons oh boy, of yeah. stuff. Yeah. I mean that, that I'm coming up on, uh, I mean, I started blogging. I know blogging. I don't even know if blogging is really a term anymore because not many people do it, but um, I've been writing on my website. Uh, I think I've had a, some form of a website since 2005, maybe 2006. Um, I think I'm coming up. I might have over 2,000 uh, articles on my website uh, as of as of now. I'm sure I could go in and it's definitely over like 1,800. But yeah, there's I've done a fair amount of writing in, in my in my career, uh, so it's uh, it's a lot to take in for sure. So when I was kind of checking over everything, kind of get myself ready, I happened to see on your Instagram profile, you, one of your things, cause so many people say like all of their titles, their credentials, their certifications, all that stuff. You said, I like cheese. I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what I saw. And so <laughs> what, yes, what inspired I, I, that? <laughs> anyone, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not a braggadocious person. So n number one, I don't have many certifications. Like I, I have my, my four year degree. Uh, I am a CSCS, uh, Certified Strength Conditioning Specialist, um, and I have taken certifications, you know, like a weekend course in there, a digital course, um, but I really don't, I don't really feel that gives me any more, any more eyes on me or, or, you know, anything like that. Like I keep, I, I, of course, use the information in my profession, um, but I think in terms of like the cheese comment and like, you know, I, I, I deadlift and I like deadlifts. I, I just think it'd be, it, 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 it uh, kind of organically uh, 
connects to people. Like, you know, there's many people who like cheese. <laughs> so, you know, if I, if, the, if that's one little thing I can differentiate myself from, from other fitness professionals and so be it. Cause certainly not, none of what I speak about or write about or talk about is really that much different than anyone else. It's just how I, how I relay it and how much of my authenticity I put into it. Um, and that, that's where that comes from. So, um, I, I do love some cheese. I, it's, it's actually quite grotesque how much how much cheese I eat. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that's that's important to highlight. Like, I think a lot of people have trouble like finding their their brand or what makes sure. them who they are in the industry. I think uh, that imposter syndrome comes up a lot for people, and it's just like it really is that simple. I mean, just like be yourself in this industry. Yes. I think people <laughs> in this industry try too hard to impress their peers, which is the thing. I get it. Um, but in terms of like getting leads or, 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 any, or recruiting potential clients, I, I got to tell you, none of them look at the letters next to your name. They don't care. They don't even know what they mean. Uh, so if you're doing it for yourself to say, Hey, look at all these certifications I've taken. Hey, that's on you. Like I, I don't bemoan anyone for doing that. Um, however, I, 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 I scratch my head to think that that's actually getting you uh, more street cred in the industry. If anything, you get more eye rolls. I, I know whenever I see someone's name and they have like an endless amount of, of letters next to their name, I'm just like, all right, like um, it's probably somebody who tries to make things more complex than they need to be <laughs> uh, in terms of how they explain things or what they write about. Uh, I, I personally just like, like to keep things very simple. Um, get people really good at the simple things, uh, and, and get them consistent. And usually some good things happen. Definitely. Um, so if we look back at like the last year and a half, the whole pandemic COVID thing and how that impacted people, because oftentimes when I reflect on that with people, they have some cool nuggets for me. Um, what were your biggest like tests within that uh, year and a half? Span? Well, uh, you know, I, as a, as a small business owner, I mean, that, that tested my, I, I guess my, my fortitude with, uh, <laughs> make, make sure I didn't like throw my face into a wall. Um, you know, that there, there was a, I will, I won't lie though. There was a teeny tiny part of me. Like I've been working pretty hard for the better part of my career. You know, I helped co-found Cressy Sports Performance and, you know, help build that to, to not to, certainly I'm not taking any credit, but I mean, it's a lot of work to run, to build a, a brand and, and not to mention a personal brand. Um, you know, and I, I run my own personal training studio here in Boston. I do a fair amount of traveling for workshops. I do a fair amount of writing. I mean, even though I'm only coaching 20, 25 hours a week, I am working outside of that, like writing programs and, you know, emails and writing articles. It's, it's, it's just an endless circle of work. Um, so I was shut down for like the government shut me down for three months last when the pandemic hit. And I had just gotten back from Europe when COVID hit. Like I was, I, I was actually in Europe presenting and it was like COVID was kind of like chasing me around. Uh, my family was like, Hey, are you, are you coming home? Are you going to be able to come home? And um, I, I made, I, if I recall, I made it home, I think three or four days before they shut down air travel. Um, so thankfully that, that, that was the case. And then it wasn't long after that, that they, they shut down, uh, gyms, which we thought at that point was only going to be for maybe a handful of weeks. Uh, that ended up being three months. Um, and eventually my wife and I, and kid, we, we live in a small apartment here in Boston. You know, it's, we hit like the six week mark. Um, and, uh, we was like, you know, why, why are we here? Why don't we just drive down to Florida at your mom's house and meaning my wife's, my wife's mom, um, where we have more space, a pool, a grandma. Um, you know, so I took that three months to, I, I, I kind of enjoyed it cause it was a little bit of a time off. Um, you know, I still, I still did virtual training with, with, a with a handful of my clients. Um, that was not my favorite thing to do in the world <laughs> to do, uh, zoom, zoom sessions. But, uh, I had realized that that wasn't for me. It was about them and, and helping them stay consistent and being there for them. Um, and, uh, then I, th I also took the time and I did, um, uh, core at home. So it was like a six week, uh, at home workout series that I made, uh, uh for six weeks. I think I did three workouts. So three workouts per week for six weeks. So do the math. Um, 
So that that was something that I put together that I could just say, hey, you're you're stuck at home. You can't really go to your commercial gym. Here's some competent workouts you can do using body weight, bands, kettlebells, et cetera. Um, so that, that, that was a little bit out of my comfort zone, but I did it and it, it, it turned out okay. And, um, you know, but yeah, that three month stretch of like that uncertainty, uh, certainly, uh, like I said, was a, a test of like my, my mental fortitude, my mental fortitude. Cause I, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. Like when I was going to be able to open up again. Um, you know, thankfully I have a very, uh, supportive cast of clients. Uh, who, when I was able to reopen, which was the end of um, June of last summer, um, you know, I had a return rate of like 75%, which was very high, uh, comparatively speaking to a lot of my colleagues. Uh, and because that was a smaller studio, um, a semi-private training studio, um, I, was able, I was able to stay open. Like the, the mandates didn't really affect me in terms of like the square footage and number of people that were allowed in the space. So... Um, you know, it just, it was just a matter of me saying, okay, well, I, I can't have three people in here at a time, but I can have one, maybe two at a time. Uh, and that, and so I was able to do that. You know, everyone wore masks and everyone was wiping down equipment. Um, you know, doors are open, fans are on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I kind of patted myself a little bit on the back, like surviving, <laughs> uh, a pandemic, but, you know, unfortunately I, I have many colleagues who weren't quite as lucky and fortunate. Um, you know, and I've, I've had conversations with them and, um, some were kind of relieved, like they, it was, it was a blessing in disguise. Like, you know, the burden of like gym ownership is, you know, there's this idea in the industry that the panacea, like the gold standard, the industry in the industry is gym ownership. And I would caution most fitness professionals that that is not the case. Um, that it, it isn't just like, it isn't like, oh, I've made it. I own a gym. Yay. It's actually pretty freaking hard <laughs> and stressful. Um, so I know a, a, a few of my colleagues were actually quite relieved that, you know, they were um, able to say goodbye and, you know, maybe move on to, to greener pastures, but certainly many were, were brokenhearted. So, uh, which was sad to hear and see. So um, I don't know, that was a long winded answer. Hopefully I, I, I provided some uh, salient answer there, but <laughs> uh uh, that's, that's at the end of the, at the end of the day, like, yes, there was a lot. I remember there's a lot that I, that I lost and I, I hesitate to say lost because I remember at the time when I was talking to my therapist, like when the pandemic first hit, I kept saying lost, like, Oh, my business just shut down. I'm losing this business. I had to, I had to cancel all these workshops in 2020. I lost all that. Uh, and she was, she was really good in reframing it for me saying, you know, it's really what you do, what you're doing is pressing the pause button. You're not losing it, um, which I thought was a very important reframe that she made. And, th and that helped me tremendously uh, through that time, which is remembering that it was the pause button. I apologize for the sound effects in the background. Um, but uh, um, yeah, that's that's how I that I handled the pandemic for 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 good and bad. That's awesome. I mean, there was so many takeaways from that, that if a person's listening carefully, like they can kind of see like they can see the clues that you've left for someone else. And it's, um, there's a lot of things that I want to kind of like, uh, continue on with, like you, you subtly sort of drop the whole thing where it's like you, you spoke with a therapist and it's cool because it's been a topic of conversation in the last few episodes, um, recently. Oh, good. Yeah, good. I think that's a good topic. Yeah. Like I, <laughs> I talked with Jordan Syatt and him yep. and I were talking about seeing our, our therapist. Like I, the, the pandemic was what caused me to, to be called out by someone close to me who told me that I should probably find somebody to talk to. And it was, it was mm -hmm. a good, it was a good call out. It was more like a call in, but it was sure. just like, um, when I went and I had my first session, I basically unloaded my, my career to them. Like that, that was what was weighing very heavily on me. And just the emotion that comes with um, having everything shut down, maybe losing sense of purpose in some yep. degrees. And it was just like so helpful for me to see that new perspective. And um, something else that you, you spoke to that kind of stood out was just like the whole gym ownership thing. Like because of um, how my career went, I got turned off from the idea of owning a gym very quickly because eight months into my career, my gym got closed. 
Um, and so I was like, well, I'm not going to do that. Like I will rent at a facility. I can be a contractor, but I don't want anything to do with owning a facility just because it was just like, that's what shaped me. And then we talked about the importance of people being themselves. And I think that coincides with the whole gym ownership, like finding the, like the Holy grail, the thing that makes you, uh, made it like when it's like, I made it like that can be in reference to YouTube that can be in reference to articles that can be in reference to um, how you made one client feel in their, their session. Like if one client is just absolutely just enthused by the fact that they're in a gym with their trainer, then that trainer kind of made it. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's cool to connect those dots. Cause I think some people are setting unrealistic expectations for themselves with regards to their career. Like that's, that's actually something that I've been told. Like I just, I set the bar really high and I'm trying to shoot for it and it's not going to happen kind of thing. Well, this is uh, it's, it's the, the, the health and fitness industry. Um, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword. Like I, I think you hit the nail on the head that it's very re- rewarding in many ways. I mean, I think a lot of what gets us into the industry isn't this idea that we're going to be making a, a bunch of money. Uh, it's really that we enjoy being in the weight room. We enjoy uh, demonstrating to people the power that being in the weight room provides in terms of like the, the confidence and the self-awareness and not to mention, yeah, numbers and getting strong and seeing the, 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 the return on your, your investment. Um, you know, and, and nothing, and honestly, there's not many things cooler than when I can take somebody who comes in on day one, they might be in a lot of pain in their back, their knee, their shoulder. Uh, they might be coming, they might be a referral from a physical therapist, or they're just woefully deconditioned. And they, 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 they there, there aren't, there, there aren't a lot of things that they can do. My job is to show them what they can do, not, not to sit there and say, oh, this is tight. That's weak. You're internally rotated there. Um, and just kind of show them how much a walking ball of fail they are. Like, I don't, I don't think there's any value in doing that at all. I want to, there's this term I like to use as a trainable menu. I like to show them their trainable menu. So what, even if you're injured, there's, we can train around it. Let's, let's focus on what you can do. Um, but it is kind of cool to take somebody who say they, they, they are, they, it's challenging for them to do five push ups to where you fast forward, uh, 60 days and they're banging out 20 uh, and they're deadlifting their body weight for multiple reps. And maybe they're doing their first chin up um, may, and then maybe stuff that did hurt their knees when they started. Don't, they don't hurt now. Um, that's very rewarding in our industry. And I think that that's a lot of the reasons why um, many of us become personal trainers and strength coaches is that we enjoy um, helping people find success. Um However, the, the other end of the spectrum is like we're a service industry. Um, you know, uh, you know, there's, I think people have these aspirations that they're going to be making six figure salaries and they're going to train professional athletes and celebrities and, and right out of the gate. And that, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> uh, I know Instagram would like to make you think otherwise. Um, but, and I'm sure Jordan probably mentioned this too. I mean, obviously he has, he has a massive following on Instagram, but it takes years to build up the reputation and the brand and the notoriety uh, to get to that point. Um, and even people who do have large followings on, on, on Instagram or Twitter or whatever, aren't that successful. Like it's, it's a facade. Um, and I caution a lot of fitness professionals to, to put all their eggs into that basket. Like I, you know, we're now programmed to think that social media is where the, is where the money is and where, you know, where the, where the glory is. And, you know, that can be taken away pretty quickly. There's nothing saying that Instagram is going to shut down next month and you're, you're, you have nothing. Uh, so I caution, I caution fitness professionals to, to put all their eggs into that basket. Hey, you do you, you know, if you have a great, if you have a, a following on Instagram, that's for a reason. Like people enjoy your content and they enjoy your personality. There is a lot of value in that. Um, however, uh, I, I certainly would diversify, <laughs> um, like where your income is coming from or, you know, how, how you reach out to your, or how you get your content out there. Um, because that to me, I, I do feel like the, the whole social media uh, phenomenon um, is fleeting. Cause I mean, it, that can go away at any moment. And we all know we get very frustrated when they change the algorithm <laughs> uh, or, or if, if one of those platforms are, are down for a day, it's like, it's like the world is on fire. <laughs> Definitely. Um, 
So, uh, yeah. So I think, you know, everyone's got to find their middle ground, like between, you know, I hate saying it cause I know it's such a cliche thing to say, but being quote unquote in the trenches, you know, where you're actually coaching people, um, in person, I think there's a, 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 a a ton of value in that. Like it's, it's hard to be a good coach online if you can't coach a person in person. You know, if you, if you're unable to coach a squat correctly with somebody standing in front of you, how the heck are you going to do it over video um, or via uh, a TikTok? I don't know. <laughs> um, so everyone's got to find their middle ground, of course. Like I, I'm not, I'm not here to say that, oh my God, don't waste your time with social media. That, I, that would just, that wouldn't be smart of me to say, because of course there's a ton of value in that, but don't, don't think that because you, your, your aspirations are to get thousands of followers, that that's automatically going to mean that you're going to have this, this luxe lifestyle. Cause that, that is certainly not the case. I, I do think more often than not, it, it is definitely a facade. Uh, I forget who spoke about it. It might even bet Brett Contreras like months ago was saying how he, um, there was a, a woman who had you know, a pretty good following, like probably 20,000 followers maybe or whatnot. Um, and, but she was putting out, maybe not even that high, maybe it was less than 10,000, but she was putting out really good content. Like it wasn't just like, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. You know, like the, where you feel like everyone, all the pictures are because of uh, a professional photographer is following them around and that's their Instagram account. She was actually putting up really good content of, glute specific exercises and how to, how to cater your squat. And like, it was really good content. Um, and she developed during the pandemic, uh, um, uh, uh, some form of uh, online training platform and she ended up doing very well. Uh, and, and then as a, as a comparison, Brett was like, you know, I, I, he, he is saying this now, I know of many influencers on Instagram who have hundreds of thousands of followers who have a hard time selling 10 t-shirts. Um, because they have the wrong following. <laughs> um, you know, it's like they're, they, you know, it's a lot of 15 year old boys who like to look at, you know, attractive people or, or 15 or, or even the, the inverse, you know, young, young females like to look at attractive people. Um, so, you know, it's just, you gotta, you gotta be careful and find, find, find that middle ground. I think I'm old school. Like I, I've, I've been in this industry since 2002 to, to kind of date myself. You know, I think if you're just someone who consistently puts out good content that has a purpose, um, and what I mean by that is like, um, don't be, don't try not to be the person that barks at an issue, like or or oh that's stupid, oh what what a stupid thing to do, or that exercise is dumb. Like solve it, like provide some provide some insight on why you feel that is not a great exercise or a diet or whatever. Um, and give people an alternative, like fix the problem. Don't just bark at it. I think if you, if you run your brand that way, you're, you're going to find an audience. Like pe people are going to connect with you and, it, and even better if you can put some of your personality in there and be a little bit more authentic. I, people can smell fake from a mile away. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think if the more like, I mean, that hence my cheese comment or why I, I definitely do not take myself too seriously uh, with, with my writing certainly, which is my preferred source of, of content. Um, but certainly even on Instagram, like I'm not someone who's very fancy with like videos and, and cutting this and putting in graphics. It's just not what I do. I'm not a mean person. Um, but uh, you know, I, I just think if you're someone who's put who's, who's putting out con consistent, good, content that's actionable and palatable to to your audience like you're probably going to do pretty well totally i mean again you dropped so many nuggets so i'll work again <laughs> <laughs> it's just like boom 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 but so the first thing that stood out to me was just like talking about how we can't have all our eggs in the social media basket and i completely agree and like the cool thing about being a personal trainer is the people that we get to learn from like our clients kind of thing like we're we're often training a lot of very successful business owners and stuff like sure. that. And so like I I am an introvert. So when I make connections with people, they're very deep and meaningful. I don't really respond well to like small talk kind of thing. And so when I'm like talking to my client in between their work periods, um, 
I learn so much and it's super cool because like I get business advice from them and I get, uh, that's the best. Yeah. That's the best. When you have very smart clients and who want, they want you to succeed. They want you to do well. And I, I'm the same way. Like I have, I have lawyers and CEOs of companies. Like they know, they know what they're talking about. Like they have experience, um, business experience. And, I, and it's, it's, it's such an awesome asset for us to have that in our back pocket sorry i cut you off no worries just- no worries this is good it's got a good flow to it um the things that stood out to me the most is like like i don't know how this happens but sometimes it's not even my client and it's like a business owner and we just like connect over instagram or something and then we have a conversation and like they've left me with lessons that have kind of etched into my brain and it's the sense that like a truly successful business person can build a business in any industry because they kind of, they know what it takes to build it up kind of thing. Like you could take all of their money away. It's, it's just like social media. You could take all of this person's followers away, but they know how to build it back up again. And that's what matters most. So if like a person was more focused on like how they build momentum that's what's going to help them. And like, I I have a segue to that because like, there's so much that stands out about you that was kind of revealed as I started to, to leave clues that you were coming on the show. Like if I put it in my Instagram story, I got messages from trainers. They're like, Tony Gentlecore is the trainer's trainer. And I was like, all right, all right. And like, I actually had a few people Mention that. I thought and, that was Nick Tuminello, not me. <laughs> that's, that's Nick's title. <laughs> well, I but mean, no, like, but yeah, I I know what you're saying. Like, I I do, I do a fair amount of presenting to other trainers. Uh, you know, when I when Dean and I, you, you mentioned you've had Dean on your show, and he's coming on again. I mean, he and I have presented together. I mean, he's like, he's essentially my brother from another mother. Like, we've 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 presented together at least thirty times, if not more, across the world. Uh, and when we do our workshops together, 90% of the attendees are other fitness professionals, which is such a huge honor. Um, and, and neither of us are bragged again, not to use, I mean, this is the second time I'm using the, the term, but we're not braggadocious dudes. Um, we're certain we we're pretty humble, I think. Um, but we know we're good. Like we have experience, we have career capital. Uh, we've worked each of us has worked with hundreds of clients, if not thousands. Um, and there's a lot of value in that. Um, and, and, and the theme is we keep it simple <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I, and again, I, I can't hammer home this point enough. I think a lot of trainer incoming trainers or younger trainers, or even if they're just new trainers in the roles, uh, they try to make things too flashy and too complicated. Like, Oh, look at me. Look, look at this cool exercise where I'm blindfolded and like, it's like, no, like just, just show people how to do stuff well. Uh, and you, you'll probably be okay. <laughs> and, and it, it kind of goes into this idea. Like if you are a personal trainer, I, what I always tell other trainers is your number one job as a trainer, even if you're working in a commercial gym, you are your own, you are your own brand. Like in a way you're, you're still your own business within a business. Uh, your goal should be to try as hard as you can to keep your current clients happy, you know, I'd rather, to me, I'd rather have 10 to 20, like consistent clients month in and month out and just keeping them happy, getting them results, building that connection, that rapport. Cause a lot of coaching isn't just the X's and O's of program design. It is actually making a connection as you noted, um, rather than worrying about, okay, I gotta, I gotta get two more clients this month because I had three leave. Well, why did those three leave? You know, like, there's, there's a reason, I mean, maybe they moved and there is a legitimate reason, but, um, yeah, there's, you know, with coaching, you know, my, my wife who you had on Dr. Lewis, uh, Lisa Lewis, I mean, she, she's probably been the biggest influence on my coaching approach since she and I have been together. Cause I, I I've learned a better appreciation of like how to cater my coaching style to the individual that is, that is with me that particular hour. And I, and I train semi-private, which I think helps tremendously. So I, I'm very rarely one-on-one with people. It happens, but usually I have two or three, sometimes four people I'm working with at the same time. So, you know, I can just crank the Wu-Tang and, you know, have that banging on the radio and, you know, people are deadlifting and squatting and rowing and I, and I'm just, my head's on a swivel. I'm doing like coaching triage. Like I'm fixing someone's deadlift technique and I'm over here finagling their, their row technique 
Um, and there's just a natural conversation and flow of the, of the session. And I, I, and I'm like you, I'm very much an introvert. Like I'm not a very talkative person. Like when I'm coaching, I have to, you know, I have to turn be on and like be, be a coach. Um, but, uh, but if I'm working with that environment, like it kind of takes care of itself. And, and you, you, like you said, like in between, like, yeah, I'm asking, you know, how's work going? How's your wife? Like this and that. And like, what movies have you seen? What, sh- what cool shows are you watching now? Um, it isn't just being, being su- a successful coach is not just about knowing how to uh, tweak someone's deadlift or how to, you know, write a coherent program that helps. That's certainly knowing the, anat- knowing your anatomy, that absolutely helps. That will definitely separate you from the masses. Um, but what I really gets people to the, the next level um, is really that, that that those soft skills that we always talk about and, and building that rapport with clients, um, you know, and that, and that, and that's stuff that, you know, 15 years ago, I would have rolled my eyes at, but like, whatever, like, let, I need to read more articles on squatting. I don't, I don't, I don't give a shit about psychology. Come on. Um, you know, my wife helped me figure out that, that, that is not the case. Cause, uh, you know, when you start working with the more clients you work with and, you know, people have different uh, ways of getting motivated and sometimes they're not being consistent with their training. Why is that? Is it me? Is it something on their end? Not to mention sometimes like clients can bring up some pretty personal things um, where I'm like, whoa, 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 in my head, I'm like, whoa, 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 what are we doing? Like, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so it, it, yeah, there's a lot of, we, we are psychologists in many ways as personal trainers and coaches. Um, you know, and, and how, and part of that is getting people to realize, you know, finding their trainable menu and, and, you know, helping them stay motivated where they're training. Yeah. I mean, it's a very multi-layered interaction that we have. Like, it's not simply just like we lay out the things and they do the things like we, we are finding different ways to communicate. We're finding different techniques that the person's more respondent to. We're asking for feedback. We're treating feedback as a gift. Like, um, it's, there's so much more to it than meets the eye. Something that I wanted to kind of bring up was just within that whole, like the trainer's trainer phrase, um, something that I've noticed is, and like it's common amongst many experienced fitness professionals, is you have this great ability to spotlight other people in the industry. Like sure, sure. You you showcase them in like your, uh, your articles or newsletters and uh, – like recently, what what really made it stand out to me the most was uh, one of my good friends in the industry, Alex McBerty of A Team Fitness. Um, you showcased something that he had put together, and I was like, "Holy crap!" Like I kind of put myself in Alex's shoes, and I was like, "That's got to feel like a million bucks. Like that's got to be awesome." And just like how much that can impact another person's career, and then how how little it it costs a person, kind of thing. Like for me to uh, speak highly of other people in my podcast, like that doesn't cost me anything. That doesn't take my clients away. Nobody's going to fire me. I'm not going to lose any money. And so I would imagine it's, it's kind of a similar experience for you. I found, I found early in my career, um, particularly with social media, um, that sharing other people's content is a, is a wonderful way of, of building your audience. Uh, I found, and, and it never hurts to give, give credit where it's due. Um, cause then we get in the conversation of plagiarism and I mean that, that runs rampant in our industry. Like, don't get me wrong. Like this industry is built on stealing other ideas from other people. Like there's nothing new. There's nothing new, nothing I can say or show or demonstrate is new. Um, but it never hurts to give credit. <laughs> uh, and even when I present, like when I'm presenting, I name drop, not again, not, not in a way that's, that's like, uh, um, uh, trying to be, Oh, look who I know. Not in that fashion. It's like, Oh, I, I learned this exercise from so-and-so. Oh, I learned, I learned this way of, of tweaking this exercise from so-and-so or, you know, Oh, I got this idea from the, um, from the barbell rehab, uh, 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 um, program that I got from Michael Mash, you know? So, um, in this industry, I, I do feel like the more you pay it forward, uh, you know, you're, you're going to, you're going to get it back twofold, if not fourfold. Uh, you know, so, you know, I, and I think another person that does it very well since we're on the topic, Andrew Coates, um, he, um, he, he's someone that all the time is on, in his Instagram stories or even in Instagram, he's always saying, these are people I follow who have helped my career. 
Um, and he and, and, and he even goes out of his way to, to these are people who are not as well known that you should know. Um, and yeah, I think that's uh, that's the least we could do. It doesn't and like you said, it doesn't cost us anything. Um, you know, and it, and I yeah, it's kind of cool to give somebody a, a spotlight and maybe give them a little bit of their their break that they need to kind of, you know, break through the noise a little bit. Like speaking of Alex, I mean, he he did. Yeah, he basically pitched me. I think I linked to an article he wrote. I included one of his articles on uh, one of my stuff to read uh, series that I do every week. Um, and he reached out and was like, Oh, thank you for um, like posting that. That was, that was really cool of you to do. He's like, and by the way, like I had this idea for this article um, and he, he, he kind of pitched it and I was like, Hey, that sounds awesome. And you know, he's like, I have other coaches. I want to, I want to quote in there myself included. Uh, and so he did it and he did a great job with it. So, and I think it ended up being, um, I think the personal trainer development center named it one of their top articles the week that that came out, which was kind of cool to see. So, um, yeah, I, and yeah, I, I agree with you. It never hurts to name, to give credit where it's due and, you know, pay it forward and share other people's work. I think John Goodman would even, uh, even agree. Like he says that all the time, like sharing other people's work, um, doesn't discredit you. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, I think there's this, there's this, there's this, there's idea that like, Oh, if I, if I share other people's work or, or give credit, like somehow it discredits me. It's like, no, it's just, if anything, people appreciate you more that you're giving credit where it's due. Uh, you know, I think that's a, it's a valuable lesson to remember. Definitely. And I mean, you did some solid name drops there. Cause like Al or yeah, well, I'll first talk about Alex McBarity because essentially he is like my Dean Somerset, like him and I, like we nice. don't live in the <laughs> same place. Like he's in Michigan. I'm in Edmonton. Um, but it's just, we genuinely support each other's careers. Like, um, I do some, some, some subcontracting for him. And so mm -hmm. it's like, we are in the trenches, we got each other's back. And I think that is such an important thing in this, in this career. Cause so often we can feel very isolated because of just like, if a person feels like they aren't smart enough or they're not experienced enough or they start comparing themselves on social media, they can get very isolated very fast. But if you seek out like a couple ride or die friends in the industry, um, it can help you, especially in a pandemic. Like the amount of times that industry friends have kind of like picked me up when I've fallen down, like I could list it off for like three days, like just how how important that is. And then the second piece of this is you mentioned uh, Andrew Coates and him and I contract out of Evolve Strength at the same facility. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't realize you were in Edmonton, by the way. So yeah, that's cool. Yeah, well, it's it's so... I mean, neat. I recognize the Canadian accent. I just didn't realize you were in Edmonton. <laughs> no worries, no worries. It's just cool because it's like, I can totally vouch for it. Like I've, Andrew has known me throughout my entire training career. Like we... We have a cool backstory of when I was getting started. He he kind of supplied me with a really convenient uh, odd job over a weekend when I had like quit my job to be a trainer and I really had no backup plan. So he's seen me um, grind in the industry and then he's seen my wins. And then at the same time, like I've gotten to see how he's just taken off on social media. I got to see the look on his face when he got his first T Nation article published. And it's like, you can cheer on your friends and it's not going to harm you. You can like yeah. put them on your page and point out where to find them and everything. And it's not going to do you any harm. And I think that's just so important for people to have sink in kind of thing. Yeah. I've never, I, I, I don't get how, I mean, and some people thrive on it, but being very confrontational and being, um, uh, very, um, mean spirited, I guess for lack of a better term on social media where they go out of their way to like, like degrade another, another coach or um, like downplay or just downplay something another coach said, or, Oh, that was stupid. Like this is what um, I, me personally, that's just not how I roll. Like I, I, I just prefer not to take part in any shenanigans. And um, I found that, you know, I, I, I would like to think in the industry, like I have a, 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 a reputation of being a nice guy and um, a good coach and impo more importantly, um, but someone who knows what they're talking about and, and, and uh, um, kind of plays, plays, play and can play it off. Like they know what they're talking about anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, 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 I definitely lean more on the side of 
being more complimentary uh, and like if, if there's something I like and I think it's a cool idea, like I'll share it and I'll give credit and um, you know, that that's not going to hurt. Like where, where, where it's going to cause problems is if you're someone who's uh, cut and pasting like Instagram memes and like not crediting the person who made it. And um, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't get why people do that I, or, or just, or they have an entire, um, their entire um, MO is to just like make fun of other, uh, other coaches and other, um, you know, people in the industry, um, you know, yeah, some, some people deserve it, but it's just not, I, I, I to me, I just, that's, that's, that's not what I want to be known for. Yeah. So um, yeah. And Andrew, yeah, he, he's, he's very professional and, um, you know, and yeah, he's, as you noted, he's, he's blown up in, uh, in the past year, year and a half. Uh, so yeah, good things come to good people. Well, I mean, you <laughs> talked about the, the, you don't like conflict and I am the same way. Like I, oh, I hate it. I hate it. I talked about this recently on one of my recent episodes, how I, uh, just retook the Myers-Briggs test. And I mean, it, it's kind of, it's not going to give all the context a person needs for self-awareness, but it certainly brought me some insights that were very helpful to kind of refine how I like kind of set up myself, my interactions, how I communicated things like context that I gave people because I realized like, um, how much it matters that I, if, if I'm like, everybody's going to have their line in the sand, their, their ethical boundaries, everything that really matters to them that like, it's like their fighting words kind of thing, but how we express that, um, is going to matter for our like long-term sustainability kind of thing. Like for me, if I'm going to progressively get uh, more talented or more experienced or smarter and still say, stay sane, I need to do that through, um, showing like leading by example i can't go after people i can't take people out i might not agree with all of those things but yeah, it's of you kind of like dropped hints to it earlier just the whole fact that like um we we can showcase how we think it should be done and just completely separate ourselves from that's how, all we can do yeah. like i i go every time i present like i i always preface it by saying like listen I'm not here to tell you that my way is the way to do it or it's the best way to do it or that you should be doing it. Um, it's just what's worked for me. I think it's going to work for you. I think you're going to get value out of it. Here you go. Here, here. Okay. Are you ready to learn? Um, and yeah, I mean, I, that's, that's, that's the best I can do. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, and again, I do think experience matters. Um, and you know, certainly there's a, you know, how much evidence-based someone is and anecdotal someone is like, I think they, they both have a place. Um, I don't think you need to be a, a complete bookworm on an evidence-based worm. Like I do think there's a lot of value in, you know, gleaning information from actually training people and seeing like, like trends and what works and what doesn't. Um, but, but yeah, I agree. Like all, all you can do is just say, Hey, this is, this is the stuff that's worked for me. I think it's pretty cool. You know, you, you, maybe you disagree and that's completely fine. Um, I mean, I see you, you nail, I, I see stuff I disagree with all the time on social media. You know what I do? I just move out of my life. Like <laughs> I see and Adam, Adam Bornstein, like a, a few times reminded me that, um, I need to do more of that because I don't know, I'm thinking if I backtrack to maybe I'm, I'm thinking maybe 2010, 2011, 2012, that, that time frame. um, there were times where, you know, I might see something or someone might make a comment to me and, and be very confrontational and I would engage and I'd be like, well, here, and, and I'd, write a complete, I'd write a complete blog post on why they're wrong and why I'm right. Um, and Adam was just like, dude, that's, a, that is a complete waste of your time. And that, that the amount of time it took you to write that blog post, you could have written a few programs. You could have written another article that was actually useful and like provided useful content. Um, you could have developed, a, uh, worked on, you could have brainstormed a product. You could have done a, a myriad of things that were better than just being an asshat and being, being confrontational. So, um, and he had to remind me of it a few times, but it, eventually it stuck. So now I just, you know, whenever I see things, I mean, me personally, whenever I see stuff on the internet that I disagree with, I'm just like, all right, that's, that's how they roll. That's not how I roll. I move on in my life. Definitely. Like, 
And I mean, like, if a person was feeling seen by hearing the whole conversation, just, like, it can be taken, it can be very, uh, like, soft feedback in the sense that, like, time is finite. Like, we're all going to die at some point. Like, we, we only have so many years. So it's like, do you want to live a life of abundance? Or do you want to look back on your years and think about all the hours that amounted of just shit talking people and it's like <laughs> you, you kind of you talked about how a person could develop a program well maybe they could also go for a walk with their dog or like sure. if, if yeah, they spend time with their family yeah, yeah exactly of course of course uh you know another another thing that just popped in my head too is just like i i i would like to think that i'm also a person that is not afraid to say when i'm wrong or when i had something wrong or i'm i'm, I'm open to changing my mind um you know, and there are a lot of a lot of coaches ahead of me that had that same mindset that I tried to mirror. Um, Mike Boyle comes to mind. I mean, I know Mike Boyle can be stubborn, but but he's also somebody that has has changed his mind on, on some pretty big topics and in, 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 in his day. Dan John comes to mind. Um, Mike Robertson comes to mind. Um, you know, I so I do think there's there's a lot of value in admitting when you're wrong, or you know, and I, I'm not scared. Like even when I'm doing workshops or when I'm writing an article. Um, if someone brings up something, Hey, like you said this thing and that's not really correct. Like it's actually, da, 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 and they make a great point. All I can do is say, you know what? That's, that's a great point. Like, thank you for bringing that up. I'll, you know, I'll, I'll look into that myself and see, um, you know, that's, that's just, there's nothing, you know, I don't, you don't, you shouldn't have to be offended or get put, put your dukes up, like try to fight people who, who, who try to point out things that might be wrong that you've said or written. Like, I mean, it's just, we're, we're not, we're not, we're, we're, we're not uh, all knowing beings <laughs> like at, at all times. So, um, so I, I think if more people just realize that, you know, you're going to be wrong sometimes, that's just the nature of the beast, um, own up to it. And just, you're, if you're willing to learn and, and correct and, and correct your, 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 train of thought on certain topics and you know there's gonna be a lot of growth there definitely i mean just like I, i've seen it pop up quite a bit with uh some of the registered uh dietitians and stuff in the space where they'll have an article on like let's say sodium and they took some information and just the way that they presented it wasn't entirely accurate and then they learned that later and like when they make those like amendments it's so cool to see because it's just like I think it's important to kind of go into a space assuming that everybody has like something that's not absolutely perfect. And it's not like they didn't sign up to be imperfect. It's just as humans, they have some, some flaws. And if we kind of yeah. give, give each other grace within that is going to be a lot easier to engage with people and make really meaningful connections and then grow because of that whole a mind, abundance mindset kind of thing. Yeah. And I, I think to that point, I think it, it, it behooves most people to stay in their lane as well. I think a lot of people get into trouble when they don't stay in their lane. So there's a re what I mean by that is there's a reason why I don't write a lot about fat loss programs or I don't write a lot about nutrition. That is not my area of expertise. I don't have a lot of expertise in those areas. So I stay in my lane. I know how to make people deadlifting ter terminators. I know how to make people strong. I know how to help people move better. I know how to program around injuries. Uh, I write on that stuff. <laughs> I, I like a good cheddar and a good Gouda. I write about I write about that stuff. I stay in my lane. So I think if people spent more time in their lane or lanes, for uh, you know, they probably do better. <laughs> they be, they get in less trouble. Uh, you know, and certainly that's not to say I'm, I'm not wrong in the, in those in my lane either. But um, I just think. You know, most most fitness professionals, if they if they just stay in their lane a little bit more, like if strength coaches talked about strength and nutritionists talked about nutrition, and you know, physical therapists talked about rehab, uh, and not saying that deadlifts are going to destroy everyone's spines, um, you know, we'd be we'd be better off. But of course, that's not going to happen. But <laughs> you know, we we can wish. <laughs> well, I mean, we can kind of incentivize people to take that path because it's just like you're only going to be so good at a thing. And if you're doing five different things, then you're limiting yourself. So if you are, let's say you're a trainer and you're trying to be more than just a trainer, well, 
you're going to take away from everything that you could accomplish as a trainer, like that impact that you have with that person, like you're going to lose out on probably some emotional intelligence or communication skills or rapport with that person that has them come back after a pandemic. Like there's a lot of value to that. And if we just looked at the value in what we have, then you wouldn't even want to be out of your scope. Like for me, I love making people strong. Like, Oh hell yeah. (laughs) It's awesome. So I don't need to do anything beyond that. Like I, I can talk about protein, but I don't need to give people like meal plans or anything. I can be like, nah, Hey, I don't like touch protein? that with a 10 foot pole. Oh Hell no. no. I, I, I really, my heart goes out to people who write meal plans and uh, like registered dietitians or nutritionists. Like, like nutrition is just a, a, a grenade that I don't want to touch with people. Like, you know, telling people like, Hey, it's okay to eat an apple. You'll be fine. Like, you know, talking people off the ledge of like, Oh no, can I, no, I had, I had pizza last night. Like, okay, l- fine. Let's move on. Like, I mean, so yeah, I, I, I agree. Like I, I don't, I don't write nutrition plans. I can talk shop, of course. Like I, you know, certainly, you know, I can strategize with clients. I'm like, Hey, you know what? I know you mentioned breakfast is kind of like a hard thing. Like, what are you eating for breakfast? Like, what, what are some things we can do to help you maybe get some more, maybe make some eggs in the morning, or maybe we'll have some instant oatmeal or whatever. Like, um, you know, I, and especially in, it was, you know, when I, I can remember when I was at Cressy sports performance, working with a lot of the high school and college athletes, like, it's like they, they'd be talking about like, Oh, what supplements should I be taking? And I'd be like, you know, when'd you go to bed last night? And they'd be like, Oh, 2 AM. I was like, why don't you go to bed? And then that's your supplement. Like your, your workouts are going to feel better. You're going to have more energy. Like go to, go to bed. Like you don't need to be asking me, you know, what stimulant you should be buying or what, or what like hydrolyzed whey protein that's been synthesized in a centaur's belly button, like and filter through organic, like, no, like go to bed. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's just, um, you know, they, they'd be like, Oh my, you know, I got I want to get my T levels up. It's like, you're 20 years old. You don't have to worry about your T levels. Like again, go to bed, <laughs> like, you know? So again, keeping things simple, uh, I, I, I really think that's just, if, if more fitness professionals focus on that and not, and not complicating things, um, and nutrition by far, I think is the most, I mean, there's just so much information out there, like this diet, that diet, carbs are bad, fats get bad, protein, carnivore diet, like, ugh, it's a mess. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, I, I really, my heart goes out to, to anyone who has to deal with that nonsense. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, it, simple is is so beneficial like some of the most ground shattering conversations i have with people is just like okay like when you go to the grocery store what do you put in the basket first and just having that conversation yeah i mean georgie fear who is a registered dietitian i respect a lot she's one of my go-to sources uh she talks a lot about she does not do what i like about her approach is that she doesn't she does not do meal plans. She doesn't give people macros. She doesn't even talk about that stuff. It's all about, it's habit-based, which I think is the way to go. It's like, I mean, cause if you're not addressing your habits, like none of that even matters. But the biggest thing that I've heard her talk about is, you know, eating act when you actually feel hunger and what that actually physiologically feels like, like to have a hunger pain and like, Oh, I'm, I'm hungry. Cause I mean, I, I mean, especially during the pandemic, I mean, I was eating just for the sake of eating. I think everyone was like, we got bored. We, we eat cause we're bored. We eat cause we're stressed. You know, we eat because we're watching Terminator two for the seventh time. Um, you know, eating, learning like to eat when you're actually hungry and then, and then stopping when you actually feel full, like th- there's some, there's probably going to be some good things that are going to happen there. Like, you know, we don't have to worry about macros. And I mean, certainly when people have dietary restrictions, they have to be a cognizant of that's important, of course, or if they have certain dietary restrictions, of, of course, that's important. Um, but again, she's someone who I can respect, I can respect that. Like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, huh, only eat when you're actually hungry. That's, that's kind of a weird concept to a lot of people. I mean, it may, but to me, it's, it seems like it's pretty common sense. And that's a, that's a perfect example of what I mean by simple, uh, keeping things simple. And that takes a lot of practice, of course. Like, don't that isn't something that just happens like in a week. I mean, people. I mean, you gotta. It takes a lot of practice and work and talking things through and experimenting and, um, 
you know, my, cause I mean, I don't, my, it's just, I, it's just, it, it isn't, it's not, it, it is intuitive, but, um, and everyone's a little bit different. Like I, to me, like I, I wake up every morning excited to eat my breakfast. Like I, I, <laughs> I love eating breakfast and, uh, and I have the same, I mean, I'm, I, us meatheads, we kind of eat the same things every day anyway. Like I, I have the same breakfast and lunch every day. Like I have a big ass bowl of oatmeal in the morning. Um, and then my second meal is usually right, right now when I get off with you, I'm going to have a, a massive omelet and, you know, some, a, a couple pieces of toast. I just like breakfast. <laughs> like I like breakfast type foods, but, um, but yeah, actually, you know, I, and I have conversations with my clients at times. Like, you know, if you, if you're just more aware of like when you're eating and why you're eating, um, and, and let's work on maybe eating when you actually feel hunger, um, and, 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 and coming up with strategies of like, when you are, when you do feel like you're eating out of boredom or you're feeling you're stressed, what are some other things, um, we could do other than raiding your cupboard? Um, you know, one simple strategy is like, okay, well, if you know what your danger foods are, don't have them in the house. I think that's helpful. I mean, it's hard. I get it. It's hard. Like mine's honey wheat pretzels. You put a bag of honey wheat pretzels in front of me. If they're anywhere near like arm's reach, like I'm grabbing a few. Yeah, if not my, the whole bag. Mine's if not the whole Oreo bag. Cookies, like I can't. Oh man, I can't keep them in the house. I have so, to. But you know, I, I, these are the type of conversations I feel comfortable having with with clients. Like, what, but when it comes to like meal plans and like actual like medical dietary restrictions, huh? No, I'm not. I'm not. I know my scope of practice. I'm not. I'm not touching that. But I can definitely have conversations with people like, hey, if you know what your danger foods are, don't have them in there. What are some things we can do to, to get you uh, some more protein in your day or some more, more fiber in your day? Um, you know, I, I like these are called, um, 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 oh man, what's the term I, I've used? Um, daily goals, like for lack of a better term, daily goals. Like I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of value in having people say, okay, your bigger goal here is fat loss. Like you want to, you want to like be leaner. Okay. I get it. So you, the training component is going to be one part of that. Okay. Like there's stuff we can do to kind of expedite that process there, but what are some, what are two to three bite sized goals that we can hit each day to help you reduce the amount of calories you're eating? So, um, all right. Okay. Let's, let's see. Like, well, maybe we, maybe for lunch, you're, you know, three times a week you have, you have some chicken breasts for lunch and, you know, we throw in, you, they gotta be manageable. And they, I think there's a lot of power with people having the ability to check off that they, they did something each day on their, on their calendar. So like I said, I'll say, we're, we're going to choose two to three goals, hydrate more, get more sleep, whatever. And then each day they mark off that they, they accomplish that. And of course we're looking for like 90% compliance. Um, I think there's a lot of value psychologically uh, to people saying, oh my God, like I'm, look at all these check marks that, I, that I'm doing. And I, I can almost guarantee over the course of a month or two, they probably lost a little bit of weight. Like, you know, they got closer to the goal. And, I, and I've used the same, the same uh, approach if someone's goal is to get stronger or whatever. It's like, okay, well, what do we have to do to, what's the big picture? What, what are some, what are some bite size minuscule, like one to two, maybe three. I like, I think one or two is more of the ballpark um, of goals we can do to help you get to that. So to me, sleep, sleep is the, is the X factor for, for many, 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 many things like go to bed <laughs> and, you know, try to try to in, improve your, your quality of sleep or the number of hours you're sleeping. Um, but yeah, I think that's that stuff that I think is in our our wheelhouse, our scope. That isn't necessarily like okay, lifting weights like that. That's stuff we can have conversations with our clients on for sure. Definitely, and I mean, like we covered so many topics, but I want to be respectful of time, so I'm gonna dial us into the last aspect oh, of no. this episode. Okay, so. Oftentimes, I get my guests to give a challenge for the audience. I'm going to kind of like test you a little bit because we've talked about so many different topics. I want your challenge to be something unique to everything that we've already discussed, something that you think will be simple and beneficial to the audience, but uh, something that maybe they haven't heard of. And so basically what you'll do is you'll say your challenge for the day is and you just put it out into the universe. Oh, boy. Boy, Chris. So this is a, this is just a challenge for the day. Um, I would. I, here's here's one because we we kind of hit on this topic earlier. Um, 
at least once today, compliment somebody. Like, say something nice. It could be a stranger. It could be like, your wife, I love you. Um, you look nice. I mean, it could be a client. Like, hey, you know, like, you know, great job on the whatever. Um, I think compliment somebody. Make somebody smile. Uh, I think that would be that would be my challenge for the day. I know it might sound a little weak sauce, but uh, I think there, there's a lot of power um, in just providing more more um, goodness in the world. I think, you know, we get so, so like swamped in with all the social media and news jargon that's that inundates us. Like there's, it's like an inset, it's like a constant tsunami of like bad news. <laughs> um, and we fail to realize that there is, there is a lot more good in the world than there is bad. Like it isn't always this dire situation. And I mean, there's a lot of shit out there going on. I don't get me wrong. That's, it gets me down just like everyone else. But, um, but I think, yeah, if you, if we, if we can all just, you know, even if it's just once a day, um, help somebody like feel good about themselves. I think that that's, uh, that's a good, that's a good thing. Totally. I mean, it's very on brand for this podcast. I am kind of the, oh, the, good, uh, the good. king of weak sauce kind of thing. But, uh, <laughs> with- well, it's like, I mean, I don't, I'm not, I, 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 I'm the first to admit, like, I, I'm not like, I'm, I'm not like this. Like, oh my God, that's amazing. Tony, you just be nice to people. Let's, I never heard of that before, but um, yeah, I, again, just keep it simple and keep it uh, nice. Read a book too. I mean, I, I think people need to read more. <laughs> definitely, definitely. And with all that being said, I'd like to thank you so much for being on the oh, show. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure.